Uh, welcome to CS2050. This is discrete math. Uh, discrete math is a course that is required for most of you. How many of you are computer science students? Almost all of you. How many of you are not computer science students? What are your majors if you're not a computer science student? Just curious. Copy. 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 I see. So, uh, discrete math is, well, let's talk a little bit about the syllabus. Let's talk a little bit about the course, and we can get into today's lecture. Um, so, I'm recording the video, by the way, and I'm going to upload this to YouTube later. I think that's the best set of notes possible, because some people, personally, I like to listen to people talk at two times speed. Some people need to pause and rewind, things like this. So I think recording a lecture is really effective. So you'll have access to these recordings uh, after class as well. Um, uh, what is discrete math? So discrete math, you have probably taken several math classes. Uh, you know, pre-calculus, calculus 1, calculus 2, maybe calculus 3 by now, uh, linear algebra, things like this. Discrete math is really different um, than all of these maths, and, but it's not necessarily harder. Uh, like the history of math, we really figured out a lot of useful things involving uh, the infinite. You know, when you have the real plane, you can plot graphs and things. You can do all kinds of nice things. You can take the integral, the derivative, the area under the curve, velocity, acceleration. All these things are really easy in some sense. They're really nice. Discrete math is not hard, but it's sort of different. Uh, by discrete, we mean in sort of, in, in some sense, for example, the integral, when you take the integral of something, it relies on the fact that you can uh, uh, take the limit towards infinity one way or another, or towards zero. There's arbitrarily small steps you could make. Discrete math is not really, um, has nothing really to do, uh, it doesn't get to use this useful property. It's about like, you know, if you have, uh, how many ways can you put balls into bins or something, where both of those are finite. If you have 10 balls and 7 bins, or... Um, you want to count block permutations or, or things like this. It's about math that is inherently about uh, over a finite domain instead of an infinite one. So in that sense, it's kind of different than anything you've ever seen. You're not going to be able to take an integral or derivative or anything. Um, so it's not necessarily harder. It is a little bit more cumbersome, uh, I think. A lot of continuous math... Uh, this property where you can take a limit to infinity or to zero, you can do arbitrarily many of something, allows it to be really easy and really useful, right? The integral of a polynomial is also just a polynomial. So things work out really nicely. Um, not necessarily in discrete math, so it's a little more cumbersome. That said, it's not hard, and I think it's actually really beautiful. Discrete math is something, usually you have taken your math curriculum, and if you're in the United States, you went like calc, you did like pre-calc, calc 1, calc 2, calc 3, something like this. And even linear algebra, but linear algebra, the variables in linear algebra are usually over uh, real numbers, you know. Um, this great math, uh, it's not necessarily hard, and some people in other countries can learn this really early. Uh, you could teach some of the concepts to, like, fourth grade students. So it's not difficult. This course, of course, is going to be college level, but it is just a different way of thinking than maybe some, some of you have seen before. Um, so it's not hard, but it is just different. You have to use a different part of your brain. You have to flex slightly different conceptually. So that is what discrete math is. Computers, all of you are somehow know what a computer is. You've used a computer before. Computers are necessarily discrete devices. I mean, they, they, have, they don't have any concept of storing a random variable, excuse me, a storing a continuous variable or something like this. You know, everything is 32-bit or 64-bit math, and that's like finite. The computer has a positive signal or a negative signal, and that's it. I mean, there's no... It, well, of course, there's in-betweens, but not really. For the, in the computational sense, there isn't, right? Um, so discrete math is in essential and extremely important for understanding computers. You know, you could go be a great computer scientist and not have taken a single calculus course. But you could not really be a good computer scientist if you don't know anything about discrete math. So in some sense, this is more important than all your calculus courses combined uh, to be a computer scientist. Why do you still have to take calculus? Well, you can't. It would be embarrassing if you didn't have to take calculus, right? So that's sort of the reason for that. Are there any questions about discrete math before we get maybe into the syllabus? About what we, any expectations? Or? Right, so uh, let's talk about the syllabus. Uh, discrete math, there's going to be three exams, and the dates are already online. 
Uh, there's three-ish units, and then there's going to be one final. The final will replace the lowest exam grade. So most people will not take the final. The final is effectively optional. So you don't have to take the final if you're happy with your three exam grades, but if you're not happy with your exam grades, you'll have to take the final. Um, and when, there's going to be approximately 40 lectures, uh, but only 30 of them are going to be like real lectures. There is, in the fall and spring, there's 75 minutes per class, twice a week. In the summer, there's... Uh, 130 minutes per class. People are getting shorter and shorter attention spans, so 130 minutes focused on anything is really difficult. Another reason I'm recording things. But, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to split each 130 minute lecture into two 60 minute blocks with a 10 minute break in between. So we'll do 60 minutes today, we'll do 10 minute break, and we'll do 60 more minutes. That's Tuesdays. Thursdays we're going to do 60 minutes, a 10 minute break, and then we're going to do uh, a sort of a worksheet session. The way you learn math is not by looking at writings on a board, but you have to do problems. Hundreds and hundreds of problems. Uh, Thursdays after the second half is not going to be a lecture. We'll just, you'll split into groups of two. You'll each have to turn in a worksheet and you'll have to collaborate on some problems. You know, some slightly, there are a lot of cool problems, I think, that are just not cool enough to put on the homework, but also just not cool enough to put in class, but just cool enough for you to do on your own. And the worksheets, I hopefully will capture this. So you'll have to do a little worksheet together, you'll have to collaborate, and then maybe I'll call on uh, someone or a group of two people to go to the board and present their work. So that's going to be 20% of your grade is these sort of collaborative worksheets. Um, right, homework is going to be the remaining 20% of the grade. Homework, uh, maybe seven or eight problem sets, maybe nine, depends on how we pace things. Summer, it's a little more experimental because it's not so nicely fixed. You know, there's no spring break, Thanksgiving break. It's, there's uh, one 4th of July break, I think. Um, the schedule is already up as well, if you would like to see the, the syllabus on the 2050 link. Uh, do you guys have any syllabus questions so far? Any questions at all? I'm okay to jump into the material if we are ready. And if you guys have any questions at all, feel free to raise your hand or interrupt me during, during uh, class today. So the first unit is going to be on uh, logic. And logic is one of the, there's really, so discrete math I mentioned is really young. There's not much discrete math out there because it's so new, like historically. We've known about uh, integrals and derivatives since, you know, uh, Archimedes and, and these kinds of things. But uh, some of discrete math is very ancient, but a lot of it is quite new. Discrete math is one of these really young fields of math. Um, there's not much discrete math out there, honestly. We have like millennia of history of continuous mathematics, but there's not, there's only two really subfields of discrete math. It's logic, combinatorics, and then maybe some trivial theorems and number theory or algebra and things like this. But everything else is pretty, pretty new. Logic is, is basically supposed to be a formalization of pure thought. What does that really mean? So formalization is sort of like a, uh, a symbolic way to represent something. In our case, we're trying to create a symbolic representation of like ideas themselves. So if you think about, think about the relationship that numbers have with addition. When you do like uh, 3 plus 2 is equal to 4 plus 1, this is a sequence of symbols you write on the board. This is 3 plus 2 equals 4 plus 1. It's algebra. You, you know, you have been working with this system for so long, maybe you, uh, we're going to take a step back and realize what is the point of all of that, you know? 3 is not, 3 doesn't exist. 3 is not a real thing. That's a symbol I drew on the board. That's an, uh, there is no, you can have 3 bananas or 3 hats, but you cannot have 3, right? 3 is not real. 3 is an idea which represents the property of having 3 of something, right? You maybe know this already, but I've never heard someone say that out loud. When you do 3 plus 2, what are you doing? The plus is a symbolic uh, representation of having two piles of things and pushing them into one big pile. If you, when you write 3 plus 2, you are applying rules of arithmetic that you know, which is just 5. But it's a simulation of the idea of like you as some sort of primal ape having three bananas in one hand and then having two bananas in the other hand and then you're like wow I have five bananas that's 
what is really going on. But this is a, a way to manipulate symbols. So like the ape person says, wow, I have three bananas and two bananas. It's the same thing as if I had one banana and four bananas. I still have the same number of bananas. It's the same thing. We are so abstracted away from this because that's true. That has nothing to do with the bananas. It's true of hats or uh, people or anything like this, right? The quantity is uh, an idea abstracted away from what you have the quantity of itself. And that's true, so true that you may have forgotten it. You just write this according to the laws of arithmetic, you know, right? You just, you know that's just five. You don't even think about if it was five bananas or five hats. That doesn't even matter. Um, uh, the, the, the conception of symbolic thought is probably one of the greatest achievements of humanity. You know, there's all kinds of conjectures do these uh, primitive pre-human ape species, do they have the idea of symbolic thought? And there's lots of debates around these things. You know, are they even people? Um, it's, it's thought it's necessary to have the representation of ideas uh, to be have any kind of sentience. Um, other questions is, can a dog add two numbers? Don't really know. If it could, it wouldn't tell us. Um, Leibniz has this quote. Leibniz, the guy besides Newton who invented calculus, uh, he has this quote where Actually, it appears that thought itself is the same. Like, when you have a set of ideas in your head, uh, somehow they are combined in a certain purely symbolic way that produces new ideas. So, think introspectively for a second. You have ideas in your head. You have a set of floating, a collection of certain statements, certain truths, and somehow you may synthesize these together to produce a new statement, right? Uh... Who's to say that the synthesis and analysis that occurs could not be done symbolically with manipulation, right? So if you have an idea in there, how do you represent the idea? Like, it's hard to, there's immediately a struggle, right? We have thoughts in our head. How do we express the thoughts? We only have one way to express thoughts, and that's with language. Language is an agreement we all have. We say words to each other perhaps with ambiguity, and then I tell you a sentence. Hopefully, if I do a good job of telling you a sentence, you will have interpreted the idea. So I have an idea, which is somehow larger and perhaps more complex than the words used to represent the idea. I utter to you a string of words. You then translate that back into an idea, right? That's sort of what goes on, but the idea certainly is more complex than the words that we say. When I say the word horse, I mean, the, the, the organism I'm describing is vastly more complicated than the utterance horse. So, unfortunately, language is a bit of a lossy communication, but it's the best tool we have. So, what we're going to do is uh, talk about something called propositional logic. The only way we can formalize the study of ideas is through the study of language, unfortunately. Because language is the way we can only rep the only way we can represent ideas. There's no way to take the idea out of the brain, right? It's, it's stuck in there. Um, propositional logic is a restricted formalization of language of declarative sentences. A sentence is declarative if it asserts truth in some sense. It's not interrogative, or it's not a question, or it's not an ambiguous statement or a joke or anything like this. It's the only parts of language that are uh, an assertion of truth, right? Any questions so far? Excellent. So propositional logic is sort of a very simple uh, syntax of symbolic thought. And it's going to help us model uh, the way we can combine truths, declarative sentences, uh, the same way that we can do arithmetic with numbers. So hopefully, pure symbolic manipulation of these symbols will allow us to synthesize a new idea. Uh, the, the, same, the, the symbols will allow us to produce a quantity the same way we synthesize an idea. That's sort of the hope. Um, so what, first off, is a proposition? A proposition is a statement uh, which may be assigned a certain truth value. So... Uh, here are some uh, propositions. Socrates is a man. That is a 
sentence in English, but it is, uh, it can be assigned a truth value, right? It's true. Um, here's another one. 10 is greater than 7. <coughs> that is also a proposition. Do you agree? It's, it's unambiguously true. Uh, the sun will rise tomorrow. Oh, my mic has been off this whole time. Testing. Okay. That's important for YouTube. The sun will rise tomorrow. True. What is not a proposition? Uh, n is greater than 7. Without knowing what n is, this statement cannot be assigned a truth value. Right? So this is a proposition. This is not a proposition. This is simply the definition of a proposition. Uh, team X is the best. Is that uh, not a proposition? Well, now we have to get into, you know, sort of what, is, what does it mean for something to be true? This is a subjective statement, so we, we may say it's not true. Or it, it's not, not true, but it's not a proposition. It may not be assigned a, a truth value because it's subjective. If you were to ask this question relative to a single person, this person asserts Team X is the best. That could be a proposition because they, they believe that to be true. Right. So truth we already see may be relative. We want to cons concern ourselves with absolute truth. Um, subscribe to me on YouTube. Is that a proposition? No. Is it asserting truth? No, it's an order. Um, so that's also uh, not a proposition. And finally, questions are definitely not propositions. What time is it? So many parts of language we already see, many parts that we use can't be formalized as propositions. But the important ones are, right? Declarative thought can we will formalize. So we will formalize propositions, and these kinds of statements cannot be formalized. Any questions so far? What is a proposition? What is not a proposition? If I gave you a sentence, you could tell me if it is a proposition or not a proposition. Intuitively, you have some understanding of, yeah, that could be true or false. So that is a proposition. Maybe it's a false proposition, but it's a proposition. Any questions yet? So a propositional variable. Now, we want to create a pure mathematical symbolic syntax for thought. So we're, you know, in math, there's no such thing as uh, numbers. There's only letters. So we're going to disregard English sentences and represent them with propositional variables. Let's see if this works. Okay. Propositional variable, we usually use P. Sometimes we'll use P, Q, R, uh, S, T. You know, they, we, you know, you use X and Y for numbers. Uh, propositional variables usually start with P. You don't want to use A and B as a propositional variable. This is just sort of polite. You know, the X and Y axis are called that for a reason. They could be called the A and B axis. doesn't really matter for the numbers when you do them. But why not call them something uh, traditional, you know? Um, a propositional variable is a letter that we assign and define to be a sentence. So we may assign the, the proposition, Socrates is a man, to the propositional variable B, uh, P. Right? So P, whenever we call P, we mean the proposition that Socrates is a man. Right? Have you guys seen something like this in some previous class? Boolean logic. So uh, when you're performing a formalization of anything, you have to, you're working with some pre-scientific concept with, you know, when you're pushing bananas together, it's, you're not, it's not true that the, the pile of three bananas and the pile of two bananas combine to be five bananas because you know that three plus two is five. But rather, three plus two is five because the piles of bananas together is five bananas. So you start with the pre-scientific concept, and then you make the scientific concept. We need to understand how we deal with truth, um, and then try and work towards defining a set of laws that will correctly simulate the truth for us. Right. So first, uh, does truth exist?
Does truth exist? Not a rhetorical question. Okay, that's good enough of an answer. If I asked you why, you might not be able to answer. But intuitively, I mean, that sounds right. So when you're dealing with this pre-scientific concept, sometimes you just have to go with your intuition about those kinds of things. Truth exists. Okay, fine. Is everything true? No. Correct. Some things are not true, and some things are true. Okay, that sounds right. Um, uh, if something is not true, it is what? False. false. We may use the word false to denote the concept of something being not true. False by definition just is not true or untrue, right? It is not true. This is a definition. False is defined to be some, anything that is not true, right? Um, so immediately we see certain statements are true. And we see certain statements are not true. And if something is not true, then it is true. Excuse me. If something is not true, then it is false. Okay? If something isn't not true, what is it? It's true. Now, this is not because we're applying the rules of propositional logic because we haven't said those out loud. But this is just how your own thought occurs. If someone tells you... I didn't not go to the store. Well, maybe they went to the store. That sound, that's a p p poor way to uh, communicate that idea, but that's true. We'll later formalize these in certain laws, the law of double negation, right? Um, is anything not true? Is it, it, does there exist something that is not true or not false? An opinion, let's consider only declarative thought. That is technically correct, but suppose we're working only in, for, in pure, proposi pure propositions, the nice sentences. If we're trying to formalize the nice sentences, each one is assigned a truth value. Can there exist a value that's assigned that is not true and not false? You have to go to your own intuition on that and say, well, I've never seen such a thing occur, so... No. This is called the law of excluded middle. We'll formalize it later. All of ancient Greek philosophy is just this kind of work. Aristotle was like, wow, everything is either true or false. So there can't exist anything that's not true or false. And he calls it, you know, there cannot exist an intermediary between contradictories. There is no third. Everything is either true or false. There's no in-between. There is no uh, subjectivity when we're dealing with objective thought, necessarily. So this, is, this will later formalize as the law of excluded middle. But these are exa some examples of why the laws will be true. The laws are true because they simulate the way we think, the way we combine ideas, right? Any questions so far? Right? So let's talk about uh, how do we synthesize ideas? How do we think about things together? Let's see if this button works. Oh, yeah. OK. Um, so if you have an idea, in some sense, it's made up of smaller ideas, right? Every idea is somehow synthesis, a combination, under what operations we haven't said yet. But somehow, every idea is made up of smaller, more atomic ideas, right? Um, so let's try and consider, instead of taking an idea and breaking it down, let's consider we have some collection of ideas and how do we produce a new idea. So what we can actually do, instead of looking to the internals, we can just look to language. Given two propositions, what are the number of ways we can combine them? Who said that? What did you say? 
Two. Two what? Two ways to combine two. Two ways to combine them. That is a bold assertion. Of all the possible ways thought could be arranged, there's only two ways thought could be produced. For two proportions. What is, let's go through both ways then. What is one way that thought could be combined? Um, proportion of one and proportion of two. And? Flip. And, well, that would be commutativity, which we'll talk about in a second. But you use the word and. So given two ideas, you may combine them uh, and. With, with the word and. Uh, I ate burger and I I could fill in the words, but maybe you know that those are, that is a proposition. Why is it a proposition? Can it be assigned a truth value? Yes. I ate burger and I ate milkshake. Explaining propositional logic to Americans, we have to use burger analogies. So, uh, but notice that it's actually two smaller propositions uh, with a cloak. This word and here is a conjunction. If you let P be uh, I ate burger, and you let Q be I uh, ate milkshake, or drank milkshake, or whatever, then uh, we write P and Q, or we use this, this better symbol, P up V Q, to mean the conjunction of those two ideas. So you have two propositions, you combine them into one bigger proposition. Now, notice that the truth of the uh, proposition, the larger proposition, is dependent upon the truth of its smaller parts. So, dependent on, on if the smaller parts are true or not is the outcome of the, if the total is true, right? So, when is uh, the larger proposition true? Um, if you didn't eat a milkshake, is the combined one true or not? It's false, right? If you say, if, if someone asserts to you um, that I ate burger and I ate milkshake, and then you found out that they didn't have a milkshake, they lied to you, right? So we know that P and Q, the conjunction of those two ideas, is true if both of them are true, right? Um, so you may say P and Q is true if both P and Q are true and false otherwise. This may seem obvious because the definition of this conjunction literally uses the word and, right? It's when both P and Q are true. There are other parts of English that use uh, this conjunction, right? P but Q. Now, but in human English actually does uh, have a different connotation than the word and. It means like, I ate a milkshake, but, uh, excuse me, I ate burger, but I ate a milkshake. It's like there's emphasis, there's a difference in emphasis on those two statements, right? However, logically, they're the same. That person did eat, a, if someone says that, they are asserting that they did eat a burger and they did eat a milkshake. So, so P but Q is actually completely identical logically to P and Q. It's the same thing. However, when someone asserts the sentence, there may be a little intonation, a little more information they're giving about, what they, about the importance of those two propositions. Now, when we're formalizing these ideas, it actually doesn't matter. That's just sort of like an opinion or something, right? So P but Q is, the, is logically equivalent to P and Q, right? Any questions on that one? Would you believe me on that? I think that's a not trivial thing. Uh, another one is uh, P plus Q. P plus Q, that sounds like both of those are true. If someone uses the word plus, that means that something was true and this other thing is true. So that whole combined statement, I went to the store, plus I had a milkshake, not perhaps the best English, but that's how, that's certainly a conjunction, right? What about um, P in addition to? Right? That's also a conjunction. There are other such conjunctions. When you're looking at someone's sentence with someone's declarative thought, declarative sentence, you can 
break that down into conjunctions. And you can see, you know, well, this is certainly true only if both parts were true, something like this. Um, but a conjunction is not the only way to synthesize ideas together. There's another one. Or. Or. I ate burger. Or I ate milkshake. Um, so this is someone, sometimes when you play the truth game, what you can assume is someone is saying this to you and you, determine, you have to determine if they're lying or not. And you can determine that based on like the smaller propositions that it's made of. So certainly we have the same uh, smaller propositions, but this is now a different logical connection than the and is. This is called a disjunction. And a disjunction here we write uh, like P or Q as uh, P and this upside down V. Oh, excuse me, this double upside down V. So it's just a V, uh, P, B, Q, right? It's a little logical symbol. Um, now, when is P or Q true as a function of when P is true or false and when Q is true or false? If someone says, I ate burger or I ate milkshake, when is that statement true? When they when ate burger false. or when they ate milkshake. When they ate, literally, or, yeah. When they ate burger or when they ate milkshake. Um, could someone, have, if, if they ate a burger, is the statement true? Yes. If someone ate a milkshake, is the statement true? Yes. If someone ate both, is the statement true? Yes. Yes. That's, I think, the first difference between propositional calculus and thought. This or is, what will, is not what's called exclusive. This, state, this proposition can be true if, um, so we say P or Q, and it's read as P or Q, is true if P is true or Q is true or both. So if, they, if I ate burger and I ate milk, or if I ate burger or I ate milkshake, and they had a burger and a milkshake, Technically, it's true, right? Now, this is sort of different than the way we use or in English, slightly. The way we use or in English is called uh, exclusive or. This one will appear less often, but we use this P and we use the XOR symbol, Q, right? This basically means exclusively or, right? Uh, this is true when P is true or Q is true, but not both. Right. Here's an example of when uh, exclusive or is really communicated. You go to Olive Garden, they say super salad. They don't. If you respond with yes, they're not going to know what you're talking about because they, when they say super salad, they're asking you to choose one. You can't choose both. Unfortunately, the deal doesn't work that way. But you get a soup or you get a salad, but you can't get both. Part of the deal, right? When the waiter says super salad, that's an exclusive or. Logically, or could mean both. In language, often it's implied that or is exclusive. Choose one or the other, but you can't choose both. It's a set of options and you pick one, right? Um, what are some other uh, like English translations of or? Um, we have like uh, P uh, or Q, that's the good one. P uh, otherwise Q. We have like P rather Q. Uh, An XOR usually communicatively, like or in English, is it depends on the context. Maybe it's XOR. You know, usually no one's going to say uh, a disjunction in English and mean both of them, right? Um, any questions so far on these two primitive? Things. And again, we're trying to found, ground the rules of propositional calculus in such a way that they correctly simulate the way we combine ideas, the way we do perform thinking. Any questions so far on just and and or? Perhaps you are familiar with and and or, because it's like the most atomic computer science operation possible. If you've known anything about Boolean circuits, uh, it's, this is the reason the computer works. right? All right, there's two more. Uh,
There's two more um, basic operations. Uh, the idea of negation. This is the one we talked about previously. When you have the uh, an idea and you mean to you mean the opposite, right? So the negation of p of p is we put this little hook and write p. What this means is it's the logical opposite of the sentence, the true, uh, the mirror. You know. So if p is I ate burger. What would be an English translation of not P? And that's read not P. I didn't ate burger. I didn't ate burger. That's one. There's a few other English translations. I ate not burger. I didn't eat burger. I didn't eat ate burger. Ate burger. Um, here's a more literal one, which is technically true. Not, I ate burger. Or you know Borat, he does that joke where he says, he'll say something, not, right, it's the same thing. You know, so in English, it's kind of obvious, the word not is itself fantastic. It's a great operation. It's probably one of those basic ones. Notice immediately the difference between uh, the negation of a, uh, the negation and the conjunction and disjunction, right? What's the immediate thing you can notice between negation and dun disjunction and conjunction? Is that the parameter that is one? Yeah, exactly. Not two parameters. It's one. It's a unary operation. It takes in one thing and it outputs one thing. Uh, conjunction and disjunction take in two things and output one thing. Conjunction and disjunction are a synthesis of ideas, right? You can have conjunctions and disjunctions of many things and build something up atomically. But if you only have negation, you can take something, you can negate it, and then maybe you can negate it again. What is, in general, the negation of the negation of a statement, right? The way we read this PEMDAS, we'll, we'll talk about PEMDAS later, but uh, when you have a bunch of symbols moving around, you'll need some sort of order of operations. Uh, you would read this as like this, the negation of the proposition, which is itself the negation of a proposition. So what is this logically equivalent to? P. P, yeah. This is called the law of double negation. We'll formalize that in a second. But these two ideas, and I'll put this sign here for now, equivalence, and we'll define that later. These two ideas are identical, right? And some, what that means by equality here you know, when you have equality of numbers, that means, in a literal sense, they, these are symbols that represent the same idea. Three, when we wrote um, 3 plus 2 is equal to 4 plus 1, this equality symbol here rep means that they are maybe not the same symbolic representation, but the idea they represent is the same. This, the, this sequence of symbols is assigned to the same idea, right? 3 plus 2 is a sequence of symbols. It's different than 4 plus 1 because it looks different but it's representing the same idea, right? Same thing here. These two are, this is uh, an equivalence, which means they have the same truth value. They are both true or they're both false. They're the same. That's, the equivalence is analogous to an equality over numbers, right? Um, negation, I think, is a, is a fairly easy one, right? Uh, any questions on negation? We get to the most important logical connection. Uh, consequence. In some sense, this is uh, the only in every way we have to synthesize ideas together. So we say uh, a, a conditional, somebody calls it conditional, as like if P, then Q. So if then sentences themselves can have truth value, right? Uh, when you Take a step back and you look at the if-then sentence. Someone gives you an if-then sentence in English. You could say, yeah, that's assigned a truth value. So 
is a declarative sentence. But it also, again, the truth of the, of the declaration is a function of its smaller, more atomic pieces. And this is, we write this uh, using symbols uh, as P implies Q. Right? So P implies Q means if P, then Q. And there's many English ways to formalize this. But note that it doesn't necessarily say anything about P and Q themselves, the same way the conjunction of ideas did say something about the smaller pieces. Rather, it's easier to understand this one as the smaller pieces say something about the, con about the uh, conditional. So if you have like some idea here and you have another idea here, the, conjunct the, the conditional is a connection between the ideas. But it itself has a truth value independent of the ideas themselves. Right? It depends on if P or Q is true or false. Um, but it doesn't say that P or Q is true, right? So let's break it into uh, the number of cases. If P is, let's say, um, if you study, then you will make an A, right? Well, let's not even be that strong. Let's say you will pass. So if you study, you will pass. That, let's say I tell you that. And I'm asserting the truth of a statement. That is a conditional. It's an if-then sentence. We'll talk about other English sentences that are implicitly conditionals that aren't written nicely as if something, then something. Now, you want to determine if I'm lying or not based on the evidence. So uh, P would be uh, you study. And Q would be, uh, you pass, right? Those are both themselves propositions. Uh, they can be assigned true or false. You did study or you did pass. You can determine the truth value of those two things, right? So then we could represent this sentence as P implies Q, right? Now, when is P implies Q true or not true? We want to determine that. So... Um, so let's suppose you study uh, and you pass. Did I lie to you or did I tell you the truth? Yeah, it's true. If you study and don't pass, Now, notice I used, I'm being careful here. I used the word don't pass instead of fail. But not passing, again, is equivalent to fail. It's a negation there in English. If you study and don't pass, but I told you if you study, you'll pass, did, you, did I lie to you or tell you the truth? All right, so. It's a lie. So we'll say P implies Q is false. Uh, if you don't study and you pass, Uh, did I lie to you or not? No, uh, not very. Not, cannot be uh, determined. Cannot be determined? Well, we don't like that in math. So actually, there is an, there is an assertion here. It is true or false. So, so, so certainly, you can't say it cannot be determined because it's, it's a proposition. It, by definition, it must be assigned a value of true or false. And I'll tell you, everyone, including me, gets stuck on this the first time they learn it. But then after, it's just, it's, it's routine. Is, if you don't study and you pass, did I lie to you or not? I either lied or I didn't lie. I think no. You think no. You, what, is it true or lie? Uh, true. It's true. That is, there's two ways to explain that. Now, that's usually new for everyone. First is sort of vacuously. Now, you could only say I lied if P was true, right? It, you could only say that it was a lie if it was true. If P is not true, you didn't study, then you cannot say that I lied to you. If I didn't lie, then I'm telling the truth, right? The opposite of lying is the truth. 
So if I didn't lie, that's not a lie, so it must be a truth. Do you agree? That follows from the fact of the double negation. Right? Um, if you don't study, but you don't pass, is P implies Q true or false? It's true as well. So why is this also true? Now, when, when I, the, the statement P implies Q says if P occurs, conditional on if P occurs, then Q occurs. But it says nothing about what happens if P does not occur. It could, you know, like let's say we have, um, like uh, if you get into a car crash, then you die, okay? Let's say I make this assertion, okay? Um, but uh, if you don't get into a car crash, uh, it doesn't say anything if you die or don't die. You can die or not die for other reasons, right? Maybe lightning or something, right? So it doesn't say that Q only occurs when P occurs because Q could occur for perhaps other reasons. The statement P implies Q, if P then Q, only asserts that if P occurs, then Q occurs. Q could occur for other reasons, right? So if you think of it this way, here's, here's Q, uh, and P says Q happens, but Q can happen for other reasons, like R or something. Right. So, vacuously, we would say vacuously, if P is false, then P implies Q is true. Right. Any questions on the uh, implication, the conditional? This is, in some sense, the greatest uh, deduction tool that we have as humans. Like, given a consequence of something, we can, given the statement, a connection between events, we can deduce consequence, right? That's our ability to infer and, and, and deduce, be detectives about things, right? Any questions on, on consequence, implication? Okay. So here's some uh, rather large list of English uh, ones for... Uh, Implication. So we have uh, P implies Q. We have if P then Q. Um, Q given P. Uh, if P Q. Um, P only if Q. That one is surprisingly difficult to understand why that's true. Because it's different than uh, a Q if P. Right? P only if Q is the same thing as P implies Q. But Q if P is, these two are the same. Right? This is not something I think that can be easily um, understood. But this is sort of the dictionary definition, right? Every semester, I think people try to understand, well, how does this connect to my actual use of English? Because I would not think that P only if Q means P implies Q. I would think the other way. Like, the word only doesn't appear to do anything between the difference between these two. Actually, it does. It flips it around, right? Um, uh, Q follows from P. And there are a few other ones like this, right? But many sentences in English are an implication, a conditional, but are not expressed as an, a conditional, right? Another way to think of a conditional is literally the if statement you use in programming languages. If proposition, then this thing occurs. There's no else block defined, right? Any questions on the conditional?
let's talk about the um, the biconditional. The biconditional is written as p if and only if q. And this is said as p if and only if q. And uh, sometimes this is shortened to p if with two f's q. If, 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 if means p if and only if q. Now, p, now the biconditional is basically uh, a double logical consequence. It's, it's a double conditional. It basically asserts p exactly and only when q, that these are identical and the same. We may express this uh, in several ways. So p, if and only if q, is actually identical to, let's say, p implies q, but also uh, q implies p. So not only does q occur when p occurred, but p occurred when q occurred. They're the same idea, right? Here's another one. Uh, P implies Q, but uh, what happens if uh, P did not occur? If P never happened, then Q never happened. When we mean to say that P is only if Q. If P happens, then Q happens. But if P didn't happen, then Q never happened either. That's what we mean here for a biconditional. These are, there's an if and only if relationship between these two, right? The if and only if is a classic part of mathematics. That like, you know, part of being a mathematician means you have to understand the way people speak to each other. You have to learn the lingo. That's what if, if and only if means, right? Have you guys seen if and only if in some other context? Right. Okay. Uh, any questions on the biconditional? Really, just the double conditional. It's both. There, let's talk about truth tables. So you guys know what a truth table is, right? Everyone has seen maybe a truth table in some, some class. A truth table is something that you, you fill it out, and it's, you work through every possible combination of truth values for something, right? So let's suppose we only have two variables. We have a P and we have a Q, right? Get rid of this. Um, what are the possible combinations of P and Q being true and false? We can have both of them be true. Uh, P could be true, but Q could be false. Uh, Q could, uh, P could be false, but Q could be true. And they could both be false, right? So what we're going to do is just sort of fill out the table uh, whether or not we know something is true or not. right? So P or Q is true when? When is P or Q true? Either is true. Either is true. Can P or Q be true when both are true? Yes. Can B or Q be true if both are false? No. So we put an F here. That's that row of the truth table. That column of the truth table. Right. What if we do P and Q? When is P and Q true? Both true. Is it true any other time? Right? What about the negation of P? Uh, when P is false. False, false. So this is true when P is false. Is it true at all when P is true? No. Now when we do the double negation, rather than go to our own intuition, what we can do is literally take the negation of this column. We're sort of seeing how we can abstract away from thinking into the syntax itself. We write double negation. We're not going to go look at P over there. I'm going to look at P here. I'm going to take the negation of this one. Now, notice true, true, false, false. True, true, false, false. Therefore, we can say P and not not P are equivalent. Right? We'll talk about a little bit more about laws later. What about uh, P, X, or Q? When is that true? P is true or when Q is true. Any other time? No. It's false when both P and Q are false. 
And both key, P and Q are true as well. One or the other, but not both. Um, this one you'll see less often. You'll maybe even never see it, but you should know it exists. What about P implies Q? When is P implies Q true? Rather, I should say, when is it not true? P implies Q is only not true when what? When P is true and Q is false. P is true and Q is false. So is it, it's true all other times. So you could mentally think P implies Q is only false when P is true and Q is false, when it's a lie. Every other time it has to be true. Right? Let's do a slightly more complicated one. Let's do um, not P or Q, right? When is not P or Q true? What we're going to do is we're going to go to this column here, look at not P, and then we're going to take the logical or of it with the column for Q, which is this column. So look at this column and look at this column and or them together. Not P or Q is Q is true and not P is false. What is this? What is the or of true and false? True. True. What about when Q is false and not P is false? False. Yes, the or of false and false is false. What about when um, uh, Q is true and not P is true? True. What about when Q is false and not P is true? True. true. To compute that, I literally just looked at the true, looked at the false, took the or. True or false is true, right? Well, look at that. True, false, false, uh, true, false, true, true. True, false, true, true. So we actually, we don't necessarily need the conditional as a basic operation when we can just represent it as uh, not P or Q. P implies Q is logically equivalent to not P or Q. Right? That makes sense. When is when is P implies Q, Q? P implies Q is true when either P is false or Q is true, right? If you think about that, when P is false or Q is true, all our times is false. So there you go. We can represent implication as just ands and nots, or is it, or is a not? Excuse me, right? All right. We have. Uh, one more small part. There are three related ideas to the conditional. These are, uh, let's suppose we have the implication, P implies Q. There are three other related implications. One is the converse which is Q implies P. That's the definition of the converse. We have the inverse, which is not P implies not Q. And then we have the contrapositive, which is not Q implies not P. Right. So if I say, given an implication, what's the inverse? We'll look at the inverse, right? Given the implication, what's the, what's the converse? Given the implication, what's the contrapositive? These are something you should remember. Most importantly is the contrapositive, which we'll talk about uh, next time. Right. So that's it.